Hey guys, it's Lady, and today is a bit of a different video than usual. I didn't do one of these end of the year wrap ups last year, but I've seen so many floating around these past couple weeks, plus I've watched quite a few over my many years watching YouTube, so I finally cracked this year and wanted to get in on the reminiscing. This year, I dove into a number of series I've never played before, which has been quite the amazing trip. So the following is just my main thoughts on all the amazing games I've had the great privilege of experiencing in 2021. Oh, and by the way, I won't be talking about any specific spoilers for any of the games, so please be at ease. So with that said, let's dive right in starting with Cold Steel 4. So even though I started this last year in 2020, I didn't finish it until February of this year, so I think it's only apt that I include it in this video. As a whole, I do really appreciate seeing the Erebonia arc to its proper conclusion. This was a long journey for the entire cast, four games of over a hundred hours each. Or well, they were for me at least. And speaking of the huge cast, I've never played a game that had as many playable characters as this one. So yay for all the customization options, I guess? Though honestly, it was a bit overwhelming at times. But I can kind of get why there are just so many characters. Like, according to this interview with Kondal, I see how Falcom really wanted to give the Cold Steel arc this vast feeling. Especially considering how much bigger Erebonia is compared to Crossbell and Liberal of the previous two arcs. So I can sort of get behind why it all just culminated in Cold Steel 4 and how it paints more in broad strokes because it's like a story about the nation as a whole rather than being a more character focused journey like Estelle's in Sky for example. But while there's a part of me that can forgive the game for failing to touch on some character arcs past a certain point, Laura being just one unfortunate example, it still doesn't really excuse the lack of focus the narrative has at times, especially in relation to its side quests. And it's such a shame too since some of them are really fantastic. Like that one in a certain town that was placed in the final chapter for some reason. It's just side quests are all over the place and honestly just distracted from the sense of urgency in the main narrative. Now as for the gameplay, this is actually the first Kisaki game where I didn't do a first playthrough on normal. I actually chose hard from the start this time, and it was still incredibly easy to choose in this game, even though they nerfed the break mechanic and many of the brave orders from CS3. I'm looking at you, Sledgehammer. Though I will say that some of the mech battles were definitely a lot harder for me. But even so, I still greatly enjoy the combat system in the CS games, NGL. Like, Sure, I prefer the orbment system of the previous arcs, like I know a lot of people do, but I also know that a lot of players have gotten bored with the turn-based link format, and honestly, I don't mind it. But it's also cool that they decided to switch it up with the new Calvert arc. But anyway, I digress. If you want to know more about my thoughts regarding CS4 in detail, you can watch this spoiler-filled video linked in the cards above. But to wrap this part up, of course I don't regret playing this game. While CS3 is still my favorite in the Cold Steel arc, the highs of Cold Steel 4 are just so good and overall Kisaki is still Kisaki in the end, meaning I love it for both its strengths and its flaws. Now, the next game I played was Persona 5 Strikers, and legit, I cannot recommend this title enough to anyone and everyone who has played either Vanilla or Royal. Meanwhile, I definitely can't recommend playing it if you haven't played the base game, because you see, Strikers in my mind is the shining example of how to do a sequel. 
By that, I mean this game really just addressed and fixed the biggest criticisms that its parent game received while still adding so much more. So for example, instead of the certain pacing issues where things dragged on in P5, I never felt like there was a dull moment in Strikers. Furthermore, Yusuke and Haru got the screen time they deserved, and in a meaningful narrative way too, and not the lazy, just fulfilling our quota checklist way, if you know what I mean. We learned much more about the antagonists as actual characters in P5S instead of how the base game regulated them to just basically plot devices. It's even hard for me to choose my favorite jail ruler since all of them are really fantastic, especially in the latter half of Strikers. And the gameplay was an unexpected surprise since before release, everyone was describing it as a Musou spin-off, though in reality I'd say it requires more precision and strategy like the combat found in your typical action RPG. I think the team did a great overall job translating the party members' unique skill sets from a turn-based format to the action combat in the game, and I particularly loved using Yusuke and On. Plus, Haru's grenade launcher was absolutely glorious. Finally, the last thing I really want to bring up is just how fantastic the music was. Both the remixes of tracks from Base P5 and the new original OSTs. Strikers is definitely a great example of how Persona music is still in good hands with Kita san now that Shoji Meguro has taken a step back from the company and headlining the soundtracks of the Persona games. So yeah, overall I loved Persona 5 Strikers and really urge anyone who hasn't played it yet who likes P5 to give it a shot. You can find it on sale quite often at around 30 bucks, which is a steal in my eyes. Now, this next game is from a series I've been wanting to dive into for a long time. I actually bought my copy of Yakuza 0 two whole years ago during Black Friday in 2019, but for some stupid reason on my end, I never actually got around to it. But thanks to a deal made with an awesome streamer friend, Bakusan JRPG, who I highly recommend by the way, I finally took the plunge into the world of Yakuza. So, kinda like the Persona series, I really appreciate how Yakuza is set in the modern world and has quite a bit of commentary on the socio-cultural climate in Japan during that time period. So much of that is explored in the incredible side quests. And like, I honestly think the side quests in Yakuza 0 are the best ones I've seen in any video game ever. They just perfectly nail the balance between the serious nature of the topics and the hilarious camp humor that just oozes from this series. The cult quest is just one example of this. And why is everything about the weapon vendor shop so funny to me? Like, just in general, truly out of any game series I've played, Yakuza 0 has done the best job at balancing the silly with the serious. This series' memes have always struck me as very Jojo-esque in a way, probably because of how the stupid wacky humor still fits with the serious tone of the main plot somehow, and I'm so glad to say I finally get the memes. Super Eye Patch Wolf always does an amazing job at explaining why Yakuza and JoJo's are so awesome, so I've linked a couple of his videos in the description below. Anyway, going back to the side content, oh my goodness, I totally understand how it can take 200 plus hours for completionists. All the minigames are so easily distracting like the JCC in my place, or otherwise known as Catfight. Like, I don't know, it's just something about the entry poses, sick music, and the fact it's a TOURNAMENT ARC that hooks me. Well, that and the 1 billion yen wins every 2-3 to three hours of save scumming doesn't hurt. 
It's really unfortunate that it's like the fan favorite to hate online, cause I think you're really missing out if you don't play Catfight. But speaking of these optional minigames, the real estate and cabaret side plots are absolutely phenomenal. Like, each of these things had enough depth in their mechanics that they could have warranted games of their very own. I really enjoyed the customization of the Platinum Cabaret Hostesses NGL, and collecting money from real estate over time was so satisfying. And just a tip for anyone who doesn't know, but the real estate collections run on real-time passing, so you can just send your agents off, then go and grab a snack while you wait for collections to finish. The money from these two main side plots makes unlocking all the epic moves for Kiryu and Majima super easy. And speaking of the combat in this game, I still can't get over how brutal yet still hilarious these special heat actions are. Especially the joint ones that you can do with other characters from time to time. But with all that said, the main narrative was super moving, like truly some peak storytelling, and that ending was just… oh it hurt so good. I absolutely loved my experience with Yakuza 0 and I can't wait to continue my Yakuza journey with Kiwami next year. Ace Attorney is another series I've had the pleasure of diving into this past year. Great Ace Attorney Chronicles to be exact. Or well, just game one so far. I still have the second game in the bundle to look forward to in the new year, I'm just taking a short little break. But like Yakuza 0, I appreciate how the real life socio-political climate from around that time period influenced the game's narrative. And by that I mean like the post-Meiji restoration era, where the newly centralized Japanese government was in its first stages of figuring out how to implement and approach this bombardment of western influence. Plus, I'm just glad the game didn't paint over any xenophobia like it never existed, since that would be such a disrespectful way to handle a narrative set in that time period. But enough of that. The thing I really loved in this game were all the unique animations that gave each character so much life and personality. The over-the-top hilarity in some cases definitely gave off a similar vibe to Yakuza and JoJo's for me, and as you should know by now, I'm all for. But yeah, in main character Runosuke's case, the animations even helped showcase his growing confidence as the game progressed. Now as for the actual gameplay, if it can even be called that, honestly the investigation parts usually ran a bit too long for my tastes. Like the second case in particular felt kind of slow, so just saying if you're feeling a lull during that part, please stick with it cause the next three trials are all excellent. The final one, case 5 in particular went in a direction I totally wasn't expecting and was quite mind-blowing in its final stages. Also, this is when I have to take a moment to give a huge shout out and thank you to Lenio, a very good friend of mine and fellow streamer who fantastically voiced all the male characters in every single one of my GAA streams. Like all of them had a different voice. And legit all of you who've played this game already know that that's a lot of lines. I wouldn't have enjoyed this game as much as I did if it wasn't for Lenny's fantastic voiceover work, so hey you can find some of our past streams on my Twitch channel to check it out at twitch.tv slash ladyvirgilia. And go ahead and follow Lenny as well since I know many of you are fans of Trails and he's currently going through CS2 New Game Plus right now. So overall, I just love the little family that develops among Runosuke and all his colleagues, and I definitely can't wait to start the second game on Twitch probably in a little less than a month, especially because of that note which left me on a cliffhanger. So now we've arrived at Uminako no Naku Koro ni, 
the sound novel that means so much to me and is actually the origins of my online name, Lady Virgilia, and is also responsible for all my account names from my MMO days. But yeah, so it's been around 10 years since I've reread this VN in its entirety. And back then, the only reason I was able to experience this work at all was thanks to the incredible efforts of the Witch Hunt team. They're very similar to Trails Geofront, only for Umineko. As well as my guildmate from Trickster Online, who'd translate just for us Umidorks in the guild. But so, since I'd like to think I've matured a lot in these past 10 years, it's no wonder why the details of Umi's narrative hit so much harder and resonated with me so much more than the first experience. Also probably because I was playing with these updated portraits instead of these. But back to Umi's narrative, going through the whole thing again just solidifies my belief that this is one of the greatest examples of subverting expectations in any medium ever. And its subversion is profoundly meaningful, by the way, and not just because they can or for shits and giggles. Like, legit the truly mind-blowing plot twists in Umi continue to build on each other and further the meta-narrative of not just its own story, but the entire mystery genre. I mean, considering all the episodes combined total more than 1.15 million English words, it doesn't surprise me that weaving in some ever-evolving meta-commentary was basically the only way to keep the premise of a family murder mystery that occurs on an isolated island fresh. And so with that said, a story this long can't survive without a phenomenal cast and characters. And honestly, I think those of you who liked the character writing in earlier Trails games will find Umi's profound characterization right on par with fan favorites like Estelle, Ren, and Kevin. Though maybe not quite in the way you're expecting. But I can't say anything more than that since Umi is kinda impossible to talk about without giving major things away. But yeah, just every character is very human in that both their greatest and most awful qualities are explored from multiple angles. Umi in general doesn't shy away from some very dark topics, but all of it's done so respectfully. And I promise you that the good and bad sides of every individual in Umineko's cast plays a role whether it's big or small, in the overall narrative. Plus, I just want to say for those of you who have read Umi already, my opinion of a certain character in episode 5 has completely changed for the better. Like, I still think they're a pretty awful person, but I absolutely love what they add to the main themes of Umineko's answer arcs. In general, I realized that I was way too young back then to understand some of Umi's deeper themes, so I'm glad I finally got around to this reread. But if all of this doesn't sell you yet, hopefully the absolutely goaded soundtrack will. It's hard to believe this little indie game has so many tracks, like 200 of them, all of which are so good. Legit, the one you're hearing right now is what my guildmates and I used to play during raids in Trickster Online. ZTS is a gigabrain responsible for this one and all the other heavy synthy tracks, while Dai has taken the skills he already showcased in Higurashi to a whole nother level with how moving his Umi OSTs are. Plus, there's just a trails level use of motifs galore for your listening pleasure in general. The entirety of Umineko's question and answer arcs go on sale whenever Steam has a major one, which, you know, comes out to like every couple of months. I'm actually even planning to do a giveaway sometime next year, probably on my Twitter, so follow me there, since I really just want more people to experience Umi's completely original narrative. But now, before I move on to my game of the year pick, 
I just have to briefly mention Genshin Impact since I've had so much fun in its world since I first picked it up last year. The lead up to Inazuma and all the new OSTs and beautiful maps that came out in the 2.0 updates make up some of the most memorable hours of gaming I've had in 2021. I'd also be remiss not to bring up how much hype, coupled with pure relaxation, that I felt exploring the gorgeous summer islands during the limited 1.6 event. And even though Inazuma's Archon quest just fizzled out so badly in its third act, I've really enjoyed all the event quests of each patch. Plus, it's just so much fun getting hyped for each new character every couple of months or so with a community of awesome people, aka mostly our welcoming Discord, which you should join if you love Genshin or any of the games I've mentioned so far in this video. I am continuing to crank out Genshin lore content on my second channel, and any other Genshin video essays I do will be uploaded there, so subscribe if you're interested. But at last, we've come to my personal Game of the Year pick, and that's Shin Megami Tensei V. Legit, this game completely surprised me with how addicting and accessible it is. Like, it's such a great feeling traversing the open world with no invisible walls, and the fantastic ambient music is always so fitting of the respective areas. I just felt so immersed in this post-apocalyptic world. There was one part around mid-game that was absolutely breathtaking. Sliding down this huge dirt slope for so long, only to come out at this very near automata-esque area. So just saying, SMT5 is a great entry point, thanks to all its quality of life features for anyone who's interested in trying out this series. Like, on one hand, I can understand how it could be hard to go back to the previous games if you start with the benefits of this one, but I'd also argue that this is a good entry point to get used to the press turn system so as not to struggle as much trying to learn that on top of the increased difficulty in the older games. Since SMT5 is the most forgiving game in the series that I've tried, it's just a good place to practice the basics of the mechanics if you need to. The QOL feature that I appreciate the most though is the Essence Fusion. It just removes so much of the time spent just sitting in front of the fusion menu, oftentimes with some fusion calculator open, trying to get that one particular skill onto a certain demon. Now in this latest installment, you can just fuse any unit of your choosing to the essence that has the skill, or even skills oftentimes, that you want. Now as just a little background, I have played a good chunk of SMT Nocturne and some of SMT4 in the past, but for some reason or another, those games just never truly hooked me. But I guess SMT5 is my true gateway game into the Shin Megami Tensei series, since I really want to go back and play the previous games now to get a better understanding of where the series is coming from. Though one thing that disappointed me in SMT5 was how many of the well-known unique skills of certain demons now hit random enemies instead of all foes or just single target, you know. The moves definitely look cool and are not necessarily bad, but I found myself using the typical Mamudun, the guaranteed hit all unless someone dodges skill, instead of Alice's random targeting die for me as an example. But overall, I don't want to go into too much detail about SMT5's characters or story right now since I'm planning to make a whole separate video on that sometime next month. But the one last thing I need to mention is how fantastic the sound design is. I love the dynamic OST when you're going from higher to lower elevation in many of the maps, and the different cries of all the roaming demons are so cool. It was honestly a bummer that SMT5 wasn't nominated for Best Sound Design category at the Game Awards, but then again, it's the Game Awards. So overall, SMT5 is my personal Game of the Year pick for 2021, just because my enjoyment with it was such a pleasant surprise, 
and I really owe it thanks for igniting a true interest in the rest of the series for me. So besides the games I've already mentioned throughout the video, I also got Persona 1 Snow Queen Route on the mandatory 2022 playlist thanks to a deal I made with my bud and fellow content creator Bubble Tea, who you should check out for some good Mega 10 videos by the way. I also can't wait to replay Zero and Azure when they officially release in English next year, and I'm also definitely looking forward to Rune Factory 5 and even that Made in Abyss game if it really is coming out next year. But I'd love to hear what your favorite games from 2021 were down in the comments, as well as the games you're most looking forward to in 2022. Also, please like this video if you liked it, and subscribe for more Trails and Mega 10 content. And if you'd like to support me and this channel, check out my Patreon. There are a number of perks, including name in the credits, Discord perks, early access to videos, and more. Also, follow me on Twitch and on Twitter if you wish, join the Discord, and finally, I want to give a huge thanks to all my patrons this year especially Killer Ninja 151, Melanie Gutierrez, Shadow Ace, John Quinones, Jared Breland, Captain Hobo, NT Luck, Big Clinky, Sam Bezjack, Thomas Perez Jr., Francesco Santoyo Rego, Silverwind847, Sathya Selvaraja, M. Yaunalan, Gigi Sora, Platinum Rose, and Malcolm Lowry. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Have a wonderful Christmas slash holiday and New Year's with your loved ones. And until next time, take care. See ya!